Okay, welcome back everyone to our Parsha Insights, Parsha Vayakel. And we're getting back to business now, back to the business of the tabernacle, of the Mishkan, of the construction after that break last week for uh, the sin of the golden calf and, and, and whatnot. Now here we are, um, here we are back where we were the weeks before uh, with, with the construction of the tabernacle. And I just want to first offer um, you know, our, our attention has been uh, somewhat uh, distracted and, and, and absorbed in the last day by what's happening in, in Ukraine and wanted to first offer, you know, all that we can. There's, not, there's a very helpless feeling of, of sitting here so, so far away and watching these horrible events unfold and, and, and just to offer our prayers and that our, our Torah study should be in the merit of, of a healing for all who are injured in this uh, in this war in this conflict, it's it's really horrific. Um, I have no action points right now other than to uh, study Torah and to make sure that uh, that the hor horrific situation in in Ukraine is is uh, at the forefront of our minds and our hearts right now. So let's get uh, let's get down to studying. Here we go. So we are furthering. We're going to jump right into the to the fundraising. Vayomer Moshe kol adat bnei Yisrael emor. Moses said to the entire people, "Zehadavar asher tzivad unai lemor." So this comes really towards the beginning of our Torah portion. The first few few uh, psukim, the first few verses, deal with with Shabbat and and, and reaffirming the commandment of the Shabbat and reestablishing the connection between Shabbat and the Mishkan because that's the essential connection that gives us the guidance as to what we are permitted and and specifically not permitted to do on Shabbat. Uh, according to one opinion, at least, has a lot to do with uh, with the Mishkan, with how the Mishkan is being built and the commandments of the Mishkan. So we've been given the Shabbat, and now Moshe turns to the people and says, make donations. Give, give what you have. And then we're going to go through what you can give. Give gold and silver and copper. And techelet and argaman and go in English so a blue and purple and crimson yarns and then fine linen and goat's hair and tanned ram skins and dolphin skins and acacia wood, dolphin skins. If you have it, <laughs> give it. Oil for lighting and spices for the anointing oil and the aromatic incense and lapis lazuli and all the other stones for setting for the aphod and the breast piece. So the aphod was the uh, was the tunic and this is going to be these are going to be operative uh, terms for us the ephod was kind of the tunic that the uh, high priest wore and the choshen was the breast plate that was on the ephod that had those precious gems in it we're going to take a look at, uh, at at what those gems look like and then we're going to skip forward 20 something verses or 18 verses after the end of all of the giving and they have so much and then finally we see hanisiim what are Nisi'im? So they're the, the princes, traditionally translated as princes. These are the leaders of the tribes. And finally, they show up. And one question that we're going to be, you know, we're asking ourselves really as we're reading this is, where have they been? Where were the leaders? You know, Moshe goes and says, everyone, give, give generously. And the people give. And then the leaders show up at the very end. And we're going to look at how the Midrash treats that, uh, treats that fact. And what do they give? Heviu et avne hashoham. They gave the stones for the setting. Et avne hamiluim la'ifod v'lachoshen. So they're basically giving these stones for, for the breastplate, for the breastpiece. Okay, and uh, the Bechor Shor notes, uh, 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 commentary notes, kol echad evan, because it just says that these these princes or these chieftains, as it's translated here, that they brought. But uh, the Bechor Shor says, what do you mean they brought? Everyone brought their own unique. Kol echad even achat. Lachtom kol kol shivto. Everyone brought one stone. Oh, everyone brought one stone to, uh, uh, everyone brought one stone for the breastplate that was meant to represent their, represent their tribe. Okay. And just to take a look at what, it may have looked like the breastplate, and uh, you know, I'll show my 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 uh, lack of familiarity with 
fine stones and jewelry that I, I, I don't know many of these things. I'm not familiar with these many of these stones, a carbuncle, I don't know, a sardius, the topaz, the sapphire. Right? These are the stones, each one, the, the tradition being that each one um, was associated with a particular tribe. That's the, that's the tradition. And to uh, go ahead for a moment to the, to the Hebrew, can I move on? Anyone want to study stones? Any gemologists amongst us who can offer insights as to why Ruvain was given this particular, the eldest was given this particular stone, the youngest, this particular stone? I don't know, but there is a logic. But isn't that, isn't that commentary as to which uh, tribe was given which stone? Because yeah. they only mention Dan and Yehuda in the text. I don't know. I don't know how they come to associate each one with each particular stone, but this is part of the part of the Talmudic tradition um, that they did. And in Hebrew, the Avne Avne Choshen. Uh, just in Hebrew, the words. And one of the reasons I, I'm sharing, there was something very interesting I wanted to share with you. Um, let me see if I can find it amongst the 46 windows that are open on my computer that I want to share with you is, just a moment, is this it? Yes, this is it. Okay, let me, uh, uh, do you see now a map? You yeah. see what I'm seeing? Okay, so when I studied in yeshiva in Israel, we'll go to Israel for a moment, when I studied in yeshiva in Israel, there was a planned city that was right next to the yeshiva. Sorry, I'm taking the slow way to get there, but there are quicker ways to get to Israel. Here we go. So I studied in a yeshiva in, uh, it, called Yeshivat Shalavim, which is right, right between, if this is Jerusalem, this is Tel Aviv, it's basically halfway between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. You see Shalavim right there. And when, mm -hmm. I, when I was studying there, um, there was a planned, uh, oops, there was a planned community called Nof Ayalon, which has since, which has since grown uh, uh, substantially. Um, this, by the way, uh, this exit over here, see this is Highway 1, running right there where my, where my, uh, the cursor is. This exit right here off of the highway didn't exist when I was in Yeshiva. It was part of the Yeshiva. It was completely difficult to get to. And this road right over here, which connects it to the city of Modi'in, also didn't exist. So this was a very isolated place, Nof I alone. And when it came time to planning the city and the city name and the names of the streets, so the street that goes all the way around the perimeter is called Hachoshen, which is the breastplate. Mm -hmm. And the names of the streets, Yahalom, Shoham, Shapir, wow. Leshem, were all the names of the jewels of the gems of of the of the breastplate. So that's one way to show yeah. a little a little uh, you know person and 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 Bareket also is one of the, one of the stones of the breastplate. So all of these and this connects to uh, just to, this connects to um, to the kibbutz of Shalavim and to the yeshiva of uh, Shalavim as well, uh, which was an, an early a very early uh, uh, aguda kibbutz a, a religious kibbutz. And but just to show in the planning of this new neighborhood. Their inspiration was drawn from our parsha, and from that's which is connected to our parsha this uh, this week. So, just a little geographical trivia about the community of Nof Ayalon. Okay, so we have. Rabbi, the, I, I have yeah. a question. Yeah. How were they able to build this tabernacle? They were in the desert. Where did they get all this stuff from? Thank you, I, Sorrel. Thank you for asking that question because that's the next few sources. Where is everything coming from? From Mitzrayim. Uh, okay, so so uh, the Chizkuni. So let's look. There are two different opinions. One is that of the Chizkuni. So the Chizkuni says the following: and the princes had brought. They'd taken these things with them at the time when the Israelites had emptied Egypt of all their valuables, each taking items appropriate to their social status. Okay, so each one brought. Uh, and they they took gems and jewels. Where did they get it? They got it. This was the this was the loot. This was the booty that they walked away from from Egypt with. This is what 
they took from the Egyptians upon upon the, at the beginning of the Exodus. Okay, so that's answer number one: is where do they get these things? I don't know where the dolphin skins are coming from. I don't know how accurate that 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 uh, trans skins. translation is, but whatever it is, they're getting their uh, they're getting their, their their materials from somewhere. And according to the Chizkuni, according to many of the commentators, they're getting it from Egypt. This is what they took with them from Egypt. The Talmud in Yoma says something fascinating. And the Talmud in Yoma looks at this word, I'm gonna go back to the verse for a moment, looks at the word in the verse, Hanisi'im. So what do we see with that, uh, with that word, Hanisi'im? So uh, any, anyone wanna make, is there an observation anyone wants to share about that word? And uh, otherwise I'll share, Hanisi'im. Peace. What's that? You said that you, the priests. Yeah, the, the leaders, Jeffrey. It, the, the yod is missing. Good. So number one, typically, you would have an extra letter between the sin and the aleph. Between those two letters, you would typically have the letter yod. So it is known as chaser. In Hebrew, means missing. There's something missing from the word. It's not unusual for a word to be written in a way that's deficient in the Torah, that doesn't have all, you sometimes could have the same word written three different ways, depending within the same verse, right? A and sometimes with a yud, sometimes without a yud. But whenever it's written in an unusual way, it invites us to, to analyze it and to understand what's, what's missing here, what's diminished here. And the word, the etymology for a moment, the word nisi'im, comes from the word naso, which means to lift to be elevated. So literally, the word nisi'im means elevated ones. Elevated ones. We understand, okay, that's the princes, that's the higher up, it's the chieftains, it's whatever, the priest, whatever, however you wanna translate it, it's the ones who are, who are exalted. So look at what the Talmud does with this, uh, with this. The Talmud says they brought the donations. They brought the donations every morning. What does it mean? My baboker baboker. What does it mean? I'm Rabbi Shmuel Ben Achmani. I'm Rabbi Yonatan. So these sages said midavar she arad lehem baboker baboker. That the that the insight here is why are we saying that they brought it every morning? Because there's another thing that happened every morning, and the Torah is trying to connect us to that thing that they gave the donations every morning and something else happened every morning. What happened every morning? Malameh. The mana. The mana. So what happened? So we're connecting these things. Malameh sheyardu lahem Yisrael avanim tovot umargaliot im haman. With the mana fell all of these precious jewels and gems. <laughs> With the mana. So where is so Sosoro? This is another answer to your question. Where do they get these gems from? According to one opinion, they got them from natural. That would be, I, I would divide this into kind of the naturalistic versus the miraculous. The naturalistic would say, how did they get it? They got it through natural means. They took it from the Egyptians. That's a logical explanation that conforms with how we understand the laws of physics and science. There were gems. They took the gems. Therefore, they have the gems. Completely understand. The Talmud says we have a different we have a different explanation, and that explanation is part of the miraculous explanation that it came down with the man. And furthermore, when we say that the nisiim, that the the chieftains or the elevated ones, what are we talking about? Nisiim mamash. Anytime the Torah says liter mamash, it means literally, literally the exalted ones. What, what are literally exalted ones? So the translation is going to give it away. What are the exalted? It's referring to the clouds. That's a different interpretation. That means when you see the word nisi'im here, don't hmm. read it as princes or chieftains. Read it as clouds. The clouds brought them these gifts. The clouds brought them these gems. After the people had given, who came last? Then the rest fell from heaven. And that's a... Uh, I mean, this, you know, in terms of the, 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 the Talmud and the Midrash, this is a very, very dramatic uh, uh, and insightful and creative approach to that verse. Because we had the question, why are the leaders coming at the end? And the way the Talmud is going to deal with that is, no, the leaders didn't come at the end. The, what they needed, the remainder fell from the heavens. It's not the leaders. It's the heavens that are bringing, that are bringing these gems.
Okay. Any questions until now, and then we'll go on to the midrash. When they say a, ta a tana, which tana are they talking about? It, it's a, a good question. It, it doesn't. It doesn't say. Um, tana is is usually just a phrase. It was taught. It can be both a verb and uh, a, and a descriptive term for a teacher. Tana, right? We use that word to describe that. Uh, typically, generally speaking, to the teachers of the Mishnaic period as opposed to an Amora, who would be somebody from the Talmudic yeah. from a later period. But here it's just used as a verb. It was taught. It was taught. OK. Um, and Tana can also just, uh, <laughs> thank you for asking this question. But the, the Talmud uses these code words to tell you what its sources are. And so Tana typically is going to be quoting a Mishnah. Tanya is typically going to be quoting a Brita, which is part of the Mishnaic period, but wasn't included in the Mishnah. So they're both from the same period, but by virtue of which word is used, it's giving you an indication of what source is being quoted. Okay, so we're going to go to the uh, to the Midrash, and the Midrash says uh, when Moshe says, we'll read in English. When Moshe said, everyone whose heart moves them should bring gifts for the Mishkan and didn't single out the Nisi'im, they became upset, didn't single out these chieftains, didn't single out these princes, didn't single out these uh, the leaders. They said, let the nation donate, and we'll fill in whatever is missing. And the nation, B'nai Israel, were, ha were happy to help with the Mishkan and quickly brought many donations. And after two days, the Nisi'im wanted to bring their donations, but they couldn't because Moshe had already commanded, let no man or woman make further effort toward the gift of the Mishkan. So the the, the, the leaders then were very upset that they weren't able to donate. And they said, at least let's donate for the clothing of the Kohen Gadol, because there was nothing left for the Mishkan, for the structure of the building. And God said, my children who are eager to donate right in the Torah, they brought more than enough. The Bnei Israel, the general people who are not the leaders, give them the credit. But for the Nisi'im, God's going to punish them. How is God going to punish them? Because there's a letter Yud missing from their name. God took it just to indicate that these leaders, so this is, again, separate from the, the Talmud that we saw before that said, read that word as clouds. Now we're going back to reading this word as leaders, and Nisi'im is deficient. The leaders were deficient. God is saying, let this be put in the record, for the record, on the record, that the Nisi'im did not do their job. The leaders waited until the people had given, and then they gave, and really it should be the other way around. Leaders need to step forward and be givers before other people. That's the way the world works. That's the way people are motivated. That's the way justice is. That's the responsibility of leadership. And here, when the leaders late, wait until last, it, it, it upsets the whole project. And God says, let that be in the record. The Nisi'im are chaser, are missing, are missing their yud. And it's, not a very, it's not a very big punishment. Uh, it, <laughs> good observation. Yes, I think I think one could think in, uh, of bigger punishments, and in fact, we've seen lots of bigger punishments in the Torah right. <laughs> itself. Um, they're not being put to death. Yeah, well. You know, they're not being put to death. But in some ways, I think of this punishment as as what would be known as a midah keneged midah, measure for measure, because they didn't give kavod. What's their their crime? Was that of kavod of 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 honor? that they didn't give the honor to the project that it deserved, and therefore they're being punished with their honor. And, and I, I would argue that uh, maybe for, for you or me, you know, having a letter missing, okay, big deal. But, uh, but for the Nasi'im who are all about honor, and, and that's part of their, what, what makes them who they are. Leaders are not leaders without, without that sense of honor or being promoted. Once they're diminished, they've lost any authority or any standing they have. It's, it's all so, it's all so, uh, so fragile for them. Yeah. So. Uh, if, I, if I may, mm -hmm. because Chilul Shabbat, um, the punishment is death. So that is so different. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting contrast. Interesting contrast, yeah. The Kliya Kar says, just based on, uh, I mean, following up and Tam, following up on this on this uh, connection, the Kliya Kar notes just to uh, to jump in the middle. He said, "Ve'etzal hanisiim, 
by the uh, or in in regards to these to these leaders to these uh, uh, to these chieftains. They were most certainly haughty um, because they, they said, They said, you know, we're going to, we'll be the ones who will, you know, who will take care of what the community can't. That was their approach to it. You know, we'll give last because let everyone give their little, their little amount. And then we're going to come in and we're going to be the ones who complete the community instead of the community completing us. That was their approach. And, uh, and that was, the, they had a sense of ga'ava. So therefore, uh, therefore, al al Kain, lakach hakadosh baruch hu mishmam. Therefore, the punishment was that God took from their name ot yud, the letter yud. Why is that significant? Kirak ot zem min Hashem hagadol hayach hakuf bishmam, because that was the only letter of God's name that was included in their in their name. So God took that only letter of God's name. There's no hey or vav or hey in in their name. God took the yud. Took it out of their name. He took the godliness out of them because of their gava, because of their of their haughtiness. So that maybe that 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 answers the question a little bit, a little bit as well. Um, one more uh, one more midrash which I found uh, which I found fascinating on this week's parasha has to do with as well. We're, we're revisiting this character of Bitzalel, Bitzalel ben Uri ben Chur Lamate Yehuda. Bitzalel, the son of Uri, the son of Chor. So who is Bitzalel? So firstly, I, I wanted to share, I saw this past week, um, a, a, a beautiful letter about, oh, there's a teaching of Rabbi Benny Lau. So we're going to go off, uh, off text for a moment. But Bitzalel is basically, he's the one in charge of the construction. But it's hard to really pinpoint his role, right? Because he's, He's not an architect. Who's the architect? Um, God. 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 I mean, who, where are the plans coming from? They're coming from God. God is giving, is delivering the blueprint. Is he, you know, so he's not the creative voice there. What exactly is his role in, in the project? He's a leader. Is he a manager? Is that it? Is he just the project manager? Or, or is there a, a, a creative component to what he's, to what he's doing? Furthermore, uh, Rabbi Benny Lau asked the question about the B'Tzalel Institute in Israel. You know, B'Tzalel Art Institute was, was named, Jerry, was founded by Bara Schatz, who was a, who was a, uh, a sculptor in, a, a, at the beginning of the 20th century, and it was and named it after B'Tzalel. So there has to be something created. There has to be something, um, you know, what, what was B'Tzalel's unique skill? So according to one of the commentators, his unique skill was that you know, if you needed to find somebody amongst the children of Israel who knows how to build with cement or with mortar or with bricks, you've got you've got a barrel full. You got you can find there are a dime a dozen. Everyone knows how to build in that way. Of that slave nation coming out into the wilderness, oh boy, you better believe that they can work with cement. You better believe that they can work with mortar and and, and bricks. But who knows how to? work with all of these refined skills, with the gems, with the precious, with the silk, with the, the, the skins, who knows how to do that? That was Bitzalel's unique contribution, was that he, had, he knew how to deal with these fine, higher level components. There was maybe we could, sorry, maybe we can call it nepotism because <laughs> his grandfather, sister was Miriam. Yes, his grandfather's sister was Miriam. Um, I think you're 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 a hundred percent right, and his grandfather also was a pretty important guy too. He, he was uh, he was there, one of the people holding up most Moshe's arms when Moshe would hold his arms up during the war with Amalek. That was Bitzalel's grandfather right there. There's a lot to be a lot to be said about that. Even though his grandfather had a questionable role in in the sin of the golden calf, and some say that Bitzalel's involvement is showing the power of 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 tshuva, of repentance. But uh, but in that in that generation, how, how do you avoid nepotism? Everybody has the same great grandfather, great great grandfather, right? Every, we're, we're all trace ourselves back to uh, back to Jacob. Um, every single one, except for the, except for the converts, every single one. So the um, Rav Cook wrote this extraordinary letter, which I didn't include in the sources, but this most extraordinary letter of blessing um, upon the uh, the foundation of of the B'tzalel. Uh, institute. I guess they asked him to write an approbation letter, and he wrote 
the most beautiful one. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and that's the only thing you can do with Rokuk because it's so poetic and beautiful and the language so deep. But he basically said, he said, the patient is a young girl and she's very sick and she's pale and her lips are blue and she has been in a deep slumber for quite a while, perhaps even in a coma. And her family is standing around her and suddenly her lips start to move and suddenly a little bit of color comes back to her lips and she utters some words that everyone leans in to hear. And the words are, Ima, Ima, mommy, where, or bring me please my booba. Bring me my doll. And can you imagine, Rav Cook writes, the joy that her family has hearing her ask for her doll. Can you imagine how happy that makes her, makes them? Even, he writes, even the elders, even her grandparents who have forgotten what it was like to be happy playing with dolls, and even their children have well aged out of the doll playing stage, they feel the joy seeing their granddaughter ask for a doll to play with. That was Rav Cook's letter of blessing. And what he meant was the children of Israel, and this is before the Second World War, this is pre-Holocaust, obviously, They've forgotten how to play. They're sick. They've lost their color. They are on the brink of death, if you will. And suddenly, they want to play. They're asking for their doll. They want an art institute to exercise creativity, to sculpt and to paint, and to do the things that people do when, when they simply want to be and to express themselves. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary letter, which I found, I found very powerful. So that's, that's Bitzalel. So let's go back for a moment to, um, to Bitzalel. Here we go. So the Midrash says, uh, says, and then there's a little bit of a, uh, uh, takes a little bit of a, uh, an aside, and it says, for every good deed, this is one of the classic um, classic sources that many know this idea but don't know where it comes from. For many good, every good deed, for every mitzvah, Sha'adamo said that a person performs mostrimo malach l'shomro, a person acquires an angel. A mitzvah creates an angel. Asa mitzvah achat, mostrimo malach asa mitzvah harbe, mostrimo malachim harbe l'shomro. It just works. One mitzvah brings one angel. Lots of mitzvahs bring lots of angels to guard to, to guard a person. Kol zman sha'adam marbe be mitzvot. Anytime a person does a lot of mitzvot, what does he do? Hu konez shem tov la'atzmo. He acquires a good name, adds to their own good name. And then it says, At shlosha shemot. And this is going to connect to, uh, to Bitzalel also. When you, you noted that Bitzalel is the son of Uri, the son of Chor. What is all this about? Because a person has three names, says the Midrash. Echad ma lo aviv imo, one that their parents call them. Ve'echad ma lo b'nei adam, one that they're called by other people. And one that one acquires for, for oneself. The best of them all is the name that one earns for, for themselves. And then the Midrash continues that This is the reward. He made a name for himself. Uh, and therefore, uh, that, well, that's why he was given the privilege of building of building the Mishkan. So the Midrash introduces this idea, which becomes, and does this sound familiar to anyone? This idea of, of the names, a names that a, per, that a person is called by, a name that a person is called by by their parents, a name that one makes for themselves. Well, if it sounds familiar, there's a very well-known poem in the Israeli Hebrew canon of poetry, Lechol Ish Yesh Shem. And I put here, if you'll click on it on, on your own time, look at the uh, attachment that was emailed with the, with the meeting notice that uh, there's a YouTube, there's a beautiful uh, uh, performance of this. It, this has become a staple in Israeli society, um, in particular around times of memory. Uh, it's often recited on Yom HaZikaron or Yom HaShoah as remembering the names of people. But, uh, but this was inspired by Zelda, by the poet Zelda. 
And this was inspired by this Midrash. Lechol ish yeshem. Every one of us has a name given by God and given by our parents. Everyone has a name given by our stature and our smile, given by what we wear, given by the mountains, given by our walls. Each of us has a name given by the stars, given by our neighbors. Each of us has a name given by our sins and given by our longing. Each of us has a name given by our enemies and given by our love. Each of us has a name given by our celebrations, given by our work. Each of us has a name given by the seasons, given by our blindness. Each of us has a name given by the sea and given by our, by our death. Um, interestingly, the translation takes, the Hebrew is entirely written in third person masculine. Everyone has a name that God gives him and given to him by his father and his mother in the translation. Uh, changes it to first person plural, to our, given by our neighbors. But that's just a stylistic, uh, a stylistic concept. So wanted to, to sh I mean, showing as well, these midrashim are, are not just uh, hanging out in the esoteric corner of, of Torah study uh, or of the Beit Midrash, but is also uh, infiltrating and impacting how we think about, about identity how we think about one's name, this concept of a shame tov and kone, shame la'atzmo, and acquiring a name for ourselves is deeply inspired by, by rabbinic writing and by, uh, by this midrash on Parshat Vayakhel. So to, uh, just to, to close for a moment, we looked at these fascinating midrashim having to do with the stones and with the gifts of the Nasi'im. We saw a number of different opinions as to where they got the stones. Did they get them from Egypt? Did they fall from the sky? And, and the Midrash that said that, that spoke about the Nisim's punishment, looking, and again, the Midrash looking for these details and taking out of these details this extraordinary world of meaning. And so the detail is the word is written in an unusual way. There's a letter missing from the, world, from the word. Okay, you or I might shrug and say, okay, there's a letter missing. The Midrash doesn't do that. The Midrash says, you want to know why there's a letter missing? Because it highlights how they are diminished, it highlights the uh, it highlights the fact that the Nisim didn't approach it in a sense of humility, but rather said, we're going to come in and be the heroes. We're going to come in last when everyone else has given what they've given. Then we're going to come in and give. No, that's not the way to give. If you have, then you give. Don't wait to be invited. Don't wait for others to give before you. That's the way. And therefore, the Nisim were punished in that way. And, uh, and their, their honor was diminished in, in the fact that, they were, uh, that, that a letter was removed. From, from their description in, in the Torah. So we saw that and then we talked a little bit about Bitzalel and the Midrash about Bitzalel's name and, and why he is in the position that he is because of what he had achieved in, in, his, in his own life. So that's, uh, that's our Midrash for Vayakel. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next week, same time, same channel. Thank you. Thank you. May, may we Shabbat all shalom. have a, a Shabbat Shalom and an emphasis on, on Shalom. That's our, those are our prayers right now. It's That's not, right. For, not only for our homes, but for the world. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi.